Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Lessons in Love series. The topic is the loving use of free will. Presented by Jesus on the 13th of July 2013 in Waterloo, London, UK. This is session one. Well, I thought just before we start, um, I'd like to welcome all of you come along. Some of you, for the very first time, have been along to something we've pre pre presented, even though you've probably watched on YouTube or other things for some time. Um, the way these presentations work, many of you would have seen on YouTube already. Basically, um, any time you've got a question to ask, um, just put up your hand and we'll be able to hand you a microphone. We have two microphone handlers. There's one on this side and one on this side. The key with the microphone, if you just hold it up, if I can maybe grab one and just uh, show you. If you make sure that you hold it up about like that. You can see on the side, not, not like that. And a lot of people, as you might notice in the video, sometimes go like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't work very well either. So what you want to do is hold the mic around about that distance from you. And Mary can adjust the volume. And if she gets them mixed up, just give her a bit of time. This is the first time Mary's done this for us today. <laughs> is today. So <laughs> Normally we have some people in Australia doing it for us. So that's how you would hold the mic. And, um, and when you're finished holding the mic, um, try to not go like that uh, when you're pointing it. It's far better to just hold it like so or give it back to the, give it back to the microphone handless for us. Thank you. The main reason why we have them is so that we can record all the sound and the video nice and clearly and that way when we put these presentations on YouTube everybody can hear all of the sound. As you would notice from the very first presentations we've done um, the sound was quite bad and it's quite frustrating not being able to hear the audience questions and so forth so we wanted to just make sure of that with your sound that would be good. Um, a lot of you have travelled, right, from some, for some distance. Um, some are from Sweden. If we've got Sweden, we've got uh, Croatia, we've got um, Belgium. Um, any, any other European countries represented? No? Belgium. 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 Flying in from France today. And, uh, of course, we're from Australia, so we've definitely travelled or further than all of you have. Um, we, uh, we had a fairly slow trip across because uh, we had three flights to get and, uh, and so it took about 44 hours or something for us to get from there to here. And uh, so it consequently took another day or two for us to catch up with the sleep because we don't normally sleep when we're travelling very well at all. So, so we arrived Saturday night, last Saturday night, and, uh, and we'll be here for till, not, uh, till next Friday. And the interview we have with ITV, which is a, a, a channel here in Britain, uh, is Monday morning at this stage. So, and they flew us over here to do that interview. And so we thought we'd take a hastily prepared opportunity to announce this, but unfortunately we couldn't give you any more than about three or four days' notice because we didn't know what was happening. Um, we only knew two days before we came to Australia um, that we actually had the flights from Australia, that we actually had the flights to come. So we didn't have much time to prepare anything. But we'd love to welcome you along today. And um, we'd also like to thank, as w while we've got the opportunity, um, Peter and Angela, uh, if you want to put your hand up, Angela. So uh, they have arranged the venue for us and, uh, and paid for the venue for us. I think it's around £450 all up uh, for the sound system and the venue. And so if you can help out with our donations, we can pay them back, actually. Uh, there's a little donation shoebox up the back there <laughs> that's been hastily prepared. And if you'd like to donate anything for helping out with those particular costs, um, it'll go into that box. And, and any that we have left over, if there is any left over, Mary and I will use for our living expenses. Um, often when we travel, that usually doesn't happen because <laughs> we usually have the expenses are much higher than what we have in, in Australia for a lot of hall highs. Um, 
a hall like this in Australia, we could probably hire for $20 for the day or $50 for the day Australian. Uh, we, the big, very big hall that we hire where we sit 300 people, um, we hire that for $100 a day. So that's at about 60 pounds or so. Yeah, it's pretty reasonable, isn't it? So thank, thanks to the Australian local government organisations, that, that is. <laughs> um, we, I don't think there's too many more things that we need to cover. Welcome, just come and grab a seat. It's good to, good to see you. Um, that we needed to discuss with people? Ah, oh, yes, toilets in the, uh, both male and female through that door at the rear on my right-hand side. Oh, you can go in through the outside as well. Okay, okay. So you can go in through the outside too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have. <laughs> okay, so I was... Um, I think we put on the net that we were going to have a discussion with you today about the use of free will. Would you like to have that discussion? Or would you like to have a different discussion? I suppose is what I'd like to put to you as an audience. For, some, for many of you, you've not been to one of these sessions before. And if uh, I, I can certainly discuss another subject. But I think you'll find the discussion of free will very interesting, actually. Yep. If we wait for the mic when you, and wait for me to say, <laughs> that's okay. It's just a bit hard to get used to with a small audience far, far away. And Mary's now got to do her thing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, she's uh, got multiple things to do. Hello. Okay. Um, am I right in thinking that on the website you said you were going to talk about how to apply love or loving action in your daily life? That's correct, yes. It's sort of like... Um, it, the, the basic discussion I would like to give today is about... Um, I, we, we create sessions, if you like, and this session is part of the Lessons in Love series of talks, right? So that's what we call it. And these are more like practical day-to-day -day lessons of how we engage love in our day-to-day -day life, right? And this session is the loving use of free will. And you could say it's going to be an intro introductory session to, the, to this subject. Um, but we'll, you'll find that it will get complicated very rapidly, <laughs> as, as some things sometimes do. The use of free will is such a huge thing in our day-to-day -day life. It's a beautiful gift that God has given us, and this is why we'd like to talk with you about it. In fact, it's one of the main reasons why you are here, is so that you learn how to use free will. We're often asked by groups of people, why did God create us and place us on the earth? And one of the primary answers is so that we learn how to use our free will. So that we learn how to use this very precious gift that God has given us, which, uh, along with all gifts, comes responsibilities connected with the gift. And we need to understand this relationship between the responsibilities of free will and the gift of free will and how we use it. So this is a subject we would like to talk about today with you. It contains many practical things that we want to discuss. Um, and most people find the discussion about free will quite difficult. And the main reason why is that from a very, very young age in our day-to-day -day life, we are often, our, our will is often curbed. It's manipulated or curved. Usually it's curbed, firstly, through our parents. You know, our parents don't want us to do certain things. And some of the things we try to do are way out of harmony with love anyway, so, so our parents attempt to train us what is in harmony with love. But a lot of the times what's, uh, what's done is that we are often prevented from acting in harmony with love because of some of our parents' addictions or other emotions. And so we grow up usually in our day-to-day -day life. We grow up, by the time we're 20 or 30 years of age, we've already been used to our will being controlled and pushed into a certain direction. So what we're encouraging people to do is to understand that all of God's universe has been created in such a way that God wishes us to learn about how to use our will in a loving manner. And so basically what I would like to do is present this concept to you. 
So he is your soul, you as an individual. Of course, as I've pointed out before to you, your soul is connected to a spirit body and material body. Right? These are the bodies you use to express yourself in the world around you. This body is being used right now to express yourself in the physical environment. And once you pass in particular, this body, the spirit body, will be used to express itself in the spiritual environment. Right? But it's really the soul which is our primary point of interest. So this is the thing we're focused on. This is the thing that it was given the gift of will. Now, your soul, being the real you, the person you actually are, is just expressing itself through these bodies. So these bodies really are secondary in any discussion that we have about the lessons in love, about the loving use of free will. That makes sense, does it, so far? These bodies are really just the appendages, if you like, that our soul uses to express itself in the environment, in the, in the physical body's case, the physical environment, and in the spirit body's case, the spiritual environment. So in the end, these bodies are just really appendages that we're using, and the soul, the real you, is controlling these appendages in your day-to-day -day life. And the gift of will, so this is a gift that God gave you, was given to the soul. And so what we need to do is firstly probably define what it means, to, what, what is this gift of will, this gift of being able to choose and decide why were we given it, and we need to discuss a few of those things first. And by the way, feel free to ask any questions as we go through this discussion, if, if, the, if you need points of clarification. So here we are, we have a soul, the human soul. Every single person is one half of a soul and the other half of your soul, your soul mate. But each soul, complete soul, and remember when we talk about the soul, we're talking about uh, sort of like this where you've got masculine and feminine qualities in the soul and this is split in two when we incarnate into two. And so there's actually, usually in the majority of cases, there's a spirit body and material body for one half of the soul and a spirit body and material body for the other half. So I am one half of one soul. And it's the complete soul that's given the will, the gift of will. Does that make sense? The complete soul is given that gift. And as such, if you think about it, when we incarnate, our soul, if we look at it from... Uh, perhaps I need to draw it in a different order, which I'll do... If so, here's our soul before we incarnate, and let's say it's a, uh, what you would classify as more of a heterosexual type of a soul. In other words, one part dominantly female, one part dominantly male, and the two halves together being pretty equal in the expression of masculinity and femininity. And when they, when they incarnate, they split in the two halves and are attached to the bodies. So here we go, we've got the feminine bodies that are created at the time of conception and the masculine bodies that are created at the time of conception and the half of the soul incarnates into those bodies. It's that soul that's been given the gift of will. It's not specifically the two halves individually that have been given the gift of will. And this is what some people find confronting right from the beginning. So they go, they're going, what, what, what are you saying there? You're saying that the other half of me sometimes will control me. That's what we're really saying, aren't we? We're saying that the two halves have this ability to, sh to share the will of the complete soul. And so therefore the two halves could be operating either independently or dependently on each other, depending on their conscious awareness of what's going on. So that's one aspect of will. Will is the gift given to the complete soul. If we just uh, wait for the mic, thanks. Yeah. What was your name? Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm Marcus. How are you, Marcus? So can the feminine aspects that are featured in the circle with the um, M and F um, be expressed in the masculine and the masculine aspects be expressed in the feminine? Yes, when the two halves of the soul split... Um, you could say that one half is dominant, in this case a heterosexual split, 
one half is dominantly masculine with some feminine characteristics, and the other half will be dominantly feminine with some masculine characteristics, potentially. Thanks. So, but but the, it's the dominant characteristics of the soul that actually determine the the attractions to the bodies. So if you're in a male body, then it's highly likely that you've been attracted to the male body because your soul is dominantly masculine, uh, your half of the soul is dominantly masculine. However, what happens, uh, part of your question sometimes is related to spirit influence. Unfortunately, on Earth, sometimes spirits surround this incarnation process who are of a different gender. And sometimes they influence the person and make them feel more masculine than, in this case, feminine. Or they can also do the same on the other end with regard to the male. And you often see these kind of influences. And when you see the spirits, you can see what kind of spirit is influencing a particular person. And so sometimes they feel like they're more feminine than they should be or, or what they think they might be. But the reality is if they're in a male body, their soul is a masculine attraction so therefore they are the dominant masculine side if you like of the soul now in the case of a soul that's splitting um, would ha which has a dominant masculine characteristics if you like one that's like this with a little bit of femininity if you like and a dominant masculine when it splits in half that'll split into two male forms right and there'll be two male bodies attracted to that soul right. and because there is a, a more femininity um, in, and but they're both, they might appear to be more feminine in their nature than the average male does that make sense? and the same applies with a female, female split yep. so, but it is the will the gift of will was given to the completed soul this complete unit Whatever, whatever its uh, spread of masculinity and femininity is, is immaterial. The will was given as a gift to it. Yep. And how it splits into the two halves is completely dependent upon the balance of masculinity and femininity within the soul. So once, uh, if we go back to what I had drawn before, once we've incarnated, and the process of incarnation is the creation of the two bodies through the process of conception. So the two bodies are created and the soul attaches itself to those two bodies. Their attachments, they, you could think of them as electrical and impulse-based conduits through which information, energy and other things flow is the way you could conceptualise it. And these particular attachments allow the soul, the half of the soul, to experience the universe in which we live. And now that the soul is experiencing the universe in which it lives, it can then use this gift of will in any way it wishes, to a certain degree. And we'll talk about the degrees as we do have this discussion further. So that's the basic process. Yeah. So if we come down here and then across, here. so go here first. I was wondering how spirits can influence that early on in a soul, soul sort of splitting, how they can, you know, before you've even incarnated, how a spirit can influence that early on, um, attracts that. Remember, this soul incarnates at conception. The problem is for most people on earth is that this, the parents of, the, of this particular soul, which was the two bodies were created for at conception, the problem for, the pro for them is that very many times the parents have a number of emotional injuries before they have the child. Mm. Now, if we had no emotional injuries before we had a child, then it's very highly unlikely that any spirit would ever be able to influence the child at all. But unfortunately, for, the, for all of us here on Earth, that's not the case. And there are times, in fact, where the child can be overcloaked while they're in the womb of the mother, even. Um, and that is created by the openings of both the mother and the father allowing this particular thing to occur. And this is why we get many child onset diseases, childhood based onset diseases, usually are caused or many of them are caused through the process of a spirit being involved with the child right at the time of birth or even earlier. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, and again, you could think of it, that is the parents using their will to not clear away their emotional baggage. So by the time they have their child, the child is affected by the baggage of the parents. And that's what it, why in the Bible it's meant, uh, you, you hear the term, that, that the error of the father gets passed down to the son and so forth through many generations. And that's why it happens is because we don't clear many times our false beliefs and our false, our, the results of our own unloving behaviour. And so our child begins to absorb that and absorb the consequences of that right from the time of conception. So you can see that if we truly loved our children, we would be very focused on healing our own emotional injuries even before we had children. Yeah. And in fact, we have the capacity on earth to have released all of our emotional injuries to the point where every single child is born free of any emotional impediments and free of any physical ailments or sickness. And we have that ability on earth, but, but we don't engage it. Mostly because we're afraid of dealing with our emotions. Yeah. But that's the process. So if we get back to the discussion of will, though, uh, if we come down here... Yeah. <coughs> um, can I just ask a, for a clarification sure. of what you were saying to Marcus? Sure. Um, so if somebody's not necessarily confused about their gender, but quite androgynous, because I've heard you say about the whole variety of souls that God made. When you say they're androgynous, if... Well, what I was, my question was... Um, when you have, a, say, a, a masculine, feminine soul, yep. do they always split in the same way? Or could the split be so that the male half actually has quite a lot of the feminine qualities and the female half has quite a lot of the masculine, if they're a straight couple? No, no. Um, the way God's created it is to not conf create confusion. So if your soul is in a male body and you feel more like you would like to be in a female body that is usually be, has been influenced by a number of external factors uh, rather than your own soul. And the external factors are all related to your parents and the spirits that surrounded your, the process of conception. I think what I meant was not so that you would want to be in a female body, but just say men I know. Some of them are... And some of them are gentle and more feminine. Don't, than they might yeah, Do you see what I mean? Don't confuse the word gentle <laughs> with... Yeah. masculinity like being opposites no, I, that is not true that this is the problem that we face on earth is a lot of times we are making value judgments based okay. on the error the reality is every person that god's ever created from and and who is eventually purely masculine and and you'll meet many of them well after you pass who have purified their souls to that point you'll find them to be very gentle people pretty much all the time so gentleness is not a feminine quality. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, uh, and harshness and hardness is not a masculine quality. I've met very many women <laughs> no, no, who enough. are very hard people. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and we need to see these particular problems as errors or emotional impediments rather than qualities of gender. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so for the majority of people on earth, they have this... Uh, we, we have our pure nature, and then we have added to our pure nation, nature all of the mud that's been thrown at us throughout our life and all of our own um, resistance to progress and our own resistance to feeling our emotions from childhood, all the damage that was done during our childhood, or, and also our own resistance to use our will in harmony with love. And these particular problems create attitudes in us that are basically based around anger and fears and shame and all of these kind of emotions. And those kind of emotions create a whole lot of problems for us throughout our life, which we then start thinking are masculine problems or feminine problems. The reality is they're just problems. And true masculinity and true femininity are just as gentle as each other. That's the reality. Yeah. Could I ask a question sure about Will? Can. Yeah, sure you can. Thank you. Um, so when you were saying... The whole soul has will. And I've heard Mary say before about soulmate attraction and how, you know, it's sort of... It pulls you're going and tugs on you, yes, yes. But, so I don't know who my soulmate is, but would there be a sense of their will could affect me now? I mean, how, how does that work, that Certainly. I have like a half of a will? Your will is not only affecting you now, but it's affecting your soulmate right now. 
And it's also affecting pretty much everybody who you live with and everybody who you meet. <laughs> That's the reality of the use of our will. I, I can see it in the kind of physical contact way of how it affects everybody. You know, from a soul-based, soul emotional perspective, your will right now and how it's being exercised affects everyone around you. It's like, this is how things like mass hysteria occur. Mm -hmm. It's the one person connecting with other people at the soul, emotional level, and eventually a, a momentum is, is created through the soul-based emotional connections. And this is why, you know, you go to a footy match, right, and sometimes when violence starts, before you know it, violence has escalated to thousands of people being involved in the violence when they possibly would not normally be. It's just the emotional part has been affected through the will of others so much that now they're all acting in a very similar way. And if you take them out and put them in isolation, they might not ever have done those particular things that they're now doing. But now they're in a situation where the will of the mass and they're open to the will of the mass, now they might go along and use their will in that direction. Yes, yeah. but, but your will has a particular with your soulmate. Yes, so let's get to the question about your soulmate. Of course, your soulmate is the other half of your own soul. So naturally, any choices you make right now and any choices they are making right now are affecting the other half of your soul right now. And it's a bit uh, overwhelming for many people to think that. that so, cause of, and, and in fact, one reason why you've not met is because your will is affecting the meeting. Both of your wills are being affected by the meeting. As you know, Amanda, you've, you've got quite a lot of anger with men, right? And that anger creates a block to the other half of your soul. And so it doesn't matter how much he wants you. <laughs> you don't want him right right at this moment. And so this pushes him away. This is your will repelling the other half of yourself. Does that make sense? If you consider, though, it shouldn't be surprising. Your soulmate being the closest person to you, because it's the other half of your soul, is influenced in a similar manner to what a child would be influenced by you. So a child, which is not your soul, it's somebody else's soul, who's incarnated into your family, is still fairly much influenced by your own choices inside of your family from an emotional perspective. Now, many of you have started experimenting with that concept, even to the point when you notice your child being like mischievous and you know, causing destruction and damage, and then you just feel a certain emotion, and all of a sudden they stop. That's the link between your emotional state, the use of your will, and the effect it has on another person's will. So it shouldn't surprise us that the very closest person to us, our actual other half, is severely affected by our own emotional choices. Does that make sense? Yep. And there was someone... No? There's no... Okay. So, so now we're, we've clarified how the soul is affected by will. So, so here we have our soul, of which we are one half, and it's been given the gift, the gift of... Free, and I'll put free in quotations because I want to define what free will is. So let's look at what will is and then we'll look at what part of it is free. <laughs> Does that make sense? With will, this is the feelings, emotions, um, thoughts, beliefs and intentions all together, all of those things together, being able to be exercised in a direction because you are self-conscious and self-aware. So you are able, through this process of this gift, to actually have self-consciousness and self-awareness. Because if, if you think about it, if we didn't, weren't free will or if we didn't have individual wills, how could we ever be said to be fully self-aware? We can't. And we wouldn't actually either be fully self-responsible. If you think about it, somebody else would be determining what we're doing, so they would take responsibility for what we did. But the reality is this gift gives us the ability to exercise every part of our being. So if we, if we summarise all of the different parts of our being, you've got the emotional part of your being, so your emotions. You've got your intellect, the, how you think. right? You've got your intentions, what you want to do in intentions, what you want to do in the future, right? 
You've got your desires, all of the things that you would like to do from a feeling perspective, all of the different types of um, emotions that you're looking for in your future, in other words, all of those things, including the aspects of your soul regarding what you, um, what you feel right now, so let's call them, shall we, your feelings, as well as what you hope to feel in the future. That is all together, if you like, your will. And the beauty of this will is it gives you the ability to, from all of these particular things, to make choices and decisions, which are independent of any other single being in the universe, including independent of God. Right. So you have the ability to make choices and decisions that are completely independent of your very creator. That's the ability, that's the gift. Now when we say they're independent, we're not saying that they're not without consequence. All right, so don't feel that just because you can make a choice in all sorts of areas, any area you want for that is completely independent, that it means that there are no consequences because God has created a universe in which there are always consequences for laws uh, broken or, if you like, your will being exercised out of harmony with love. And this is the thing we'd like to discuss today. But we must understand first that our choices and decisions are not just based around our intellect. Many of us, from a moment-by-moment -moment case, are making choices from our emotional places and in fact the majority of our thoughts come from the emotions that the different things are triggered by the, the stimuli that comes from in our environment so our environment is that our environment is the stimulus that creates uh, and also causes interaction we have interaction with our environment through these particular parts of ourselves and I would even add many other things in there beliefs and passions and all sorts of things would go in this column that how we exercise our will means that with every one of these things, we have a choice. We have decisions to make. Now, for many of us, we don't make choices and decisions with many of them. We just go along with whatever everybody else does or we go along with what we have been taught from a very young age to do. So in some cases, we don't even think we've got a choice. But the reality is we do have a choice on every single thing. Every single thing that's occurring in our life, there is a choice. And God has given us this ability to make a choice. And without the ability to make a choice, we would never have been free-thinking, free-feeling, sentient beings. We would have to have had some kind of control over us without the ability to make a choice. If we go to them. <clears throat> Hi. Um, what about the inertia of, of um, old habits, patterns, behaviours, inherited things? I yep. mean, how does that, that, that... How is that free will? Well, let, let's or see how what's... Is that God's, you know, how is that the will of love? Yeah. Right? Um, firstly, we must first see where they come from, our old habits. So if we look at our habits, if, um, and some of them... Um, stubble. Some of them come from um, our environment, of course, where we've been over and over, we've been educated through a process to, for, to conform into a certain way of thinking or feeling. But in that process, there were emotions and feelings created. There were desires created and so forth. So for if I can give some practical examples. Let's say we have the habit... Um, now and let's uh, we can go for an addictive habit such as like smoking we, you know that's our habit let's call it a habit that that habit usually came from a number of sources firstly the fact is that there are large companies and businesses that rely on us having that habit 
And so they've done a lot of advertising and they've done a lot of influential type of things upon us to think that we might take up smoking. And they made smoking look like cool and acceptable and socially, you know, a way to be socially involved, right? And so they created, through that process of advertising, desires in us that we didn't have before. And we chose to engage those desires. And then on top of that, we might have feelings of fear right, inside of us that come from our childhood. And we find that whenever we engage the smoking process, that our fear goes down. Right? So in other words, we feel, ah, oh, this is a relaxed sort of a feeling. And so there's another feeling that we're avoiding by taking up the habit. And so what you will find generally with regard to our habits is that every one of them have been created, usually in our formative years, through a process that, that occurred, where not only were we fed things from the environment, but also from that moment on we had to make a choice. Now, for some of us, some of the habits were formulated so young that it's almost like our parents made the choice for us. So that was their free will imposing itself upon us and making the choice for us. Or some of the habits occurred during our teenage years when we were just experimenting with life and we made some choices that formed many of our habits at that particular time. So there is, with habits, there is always a mixture of different wills involved. Not only just our own, but the will of society in general and the will of an environment in which we grew up all affect the creation of the habit itself. And so what we need to understand, though, is that there needs to be some kind of priority system in the way in which we honour our will. For the majority of us, we don't honour our will as our own primary concern first. We tend to assimilate from our environment what the environment wants for us to do. That's what we have a tendency to do first. And the reason why we do that is because the majority of us know that whenever we do something that everyone else doesn't like, they have a tendency to attack us in some way, whether that be emotionally or even physically, they have a tendency to put us down and attack us. And, and that's a way of manipulating our will. So many of us have learned that actually we, we feel that we can't make choices and decisions without taking into account our parents, right? our partner, if we have one, society in general, our children, the government, the religion, And unfortunately, by the time we've got that far, <laughs> there's very little space for our will. Because most of the time we're absorbing so much of everybody else's will by that time that what's left is next to nothing in terms of what do we really want. And this is one of the problems of the use of free will on the planet, is that we have so many things and people and pressures formulating what we should do with our will that by the time we've considered all of these things, we don't end up doing what we would like to be doing. And in fact, many of us don't even know that we're not doing what we'd like to be doing by that stage. Because we're so invested emotionally with feelings and other things in all of these people and how they view us that we have forgotten who we even are half the time. And so therefore, we don't know what is our own will and what is the will of all of the people that surround us. And that's the problem that we face, I feel, on the planet. So, so what we need to do instead is we need to start honouring this gift of free will that it's ours, that it's a gift given directly to yourself that you can make choices and decisions independent of society, independent of your partner, independent of parents, independent of children, independent of government, independent of religion. You can make choices and decisions. This is a gift God gave you to be able to make choices and decisions, whatever choices and decisions you want. And the key is to understand that. And what I feel is happening quite a lot on the planet is that we are so ingrained in certain choices and decisions that we're really in a perpetual 24 by 7 cult of some kind. Whether it, and the cult's different depending on where we grew up, what culture we come from, what religious faith we come from, 
what uh, governmental system that we've grown up under and so forth. But in the end, there's all these pressures pressuring us, conforming us into what that particular society or what we feel, you know, that particular society feels you should be. Now, this is the problem, is that very li there is very little honouring of an individual's free will on the planet. Now, I'm not suggesting that just because we should honour the free will of the individual, that we should honour their right to do anything, including anything damaging to other people. I'm not suggesting that. And this is why we've called this talk the loving use of free will. We feel quite strongly that there is an unloving way we can use our will and a loving way we can use our will. But don't think that just because society thinks that you're being unloving, that you actually are. Because the loving use of will is from God's perspective, not our own. Right? All of God's laws are all about God's perspective and not our own. We have created on the planet all the laws based around these things. So our parents had a set of laws, if you think about it. They had a set of rules or laws that applied to you while you were growing up. And you go to another family and they didn't have the same laws. They didn't have the same rules. So you could say your parents had a set of rules or laws independent of God's laws that they wanted to impose upon you while you were growing up. And then you've got your partner. When you meet her or him, he's got a set of laws or she's got a set of laws. And, th and they've got a set of laws about what you should be if you're a good partner, right? And what they think they should be if they're a good partner. And sometimes that set of laws and your set of laws about that are completely in opposition to each other. And so you don't get along very well. That, that's one of the reasons why we don't get along with people. In society, there's a set of laws, a set of principles, a set of guiding, guiding guidelines. And like one of our laws here in most Western countries is we're going to be taxed. And the law says, when's your taxation period of the year? Is it from December or January to December? April, April to, to April. April to March or something. Yeah, April to April, okay. In Australia, it's from uh, July the 1st to June the 30th, right? That's ours in Australia. That's the law. We've got to we live with that law and we can't decide to do, oh, I'm going to do my return, you know, in, in December, right? Because you're going to, society is going to put some pressure on you to conform to the law, right? And that law in, it, in itself is a method of conforming the will, of conforming the bill. Now, there are practical reasons for doing it for a government, and so we might agree to it. It might be loving to agree to it. And I'm not suggesting that taxation is an unloving process, by the way, because there are loving things that are accomplished through taxation. However, society has specific laws about it, every single society generally. Our children even come home from school with a different law than we have given them uh, when, we're, when we're bringing them up. And sometimes they'll come home and tell you a lot of things that you should be now doing. You know, you, you should be getting my iPod for me or my iPhone. You know, every other child at school has got, got an iPhone and, now, you know, they're 10 too. They should have one. And they've all got one I should have one. And so they start imposing laws that have come from society and try to impose them upon life on home. The same goes with the government. And religious law is huge in the planet today still. You know, we see, we see large numbers of religions controlling large masses of people through religious thought by, in, by saying, we've written a book or we've got a book here, that's the law. That's the law you must follow. And the question really comes is, are all of these laws and are all of these principles that people say, are they all loving and are they using our... Uh, are they assisting us to use our will, our free, the gift of free will that we have, in a loving way? And what I suggest to you is, no, that's not the case at all. Like, it's not the case that every single person in society and every single society-based pressure is loving. There are many unloving pressures that we get upon us every single day and we've conformed to them. And we actually even do them automatically because we are afraid of the results of not doing so. So there's our will. So we've talked about the will part. All right. Now let's talk about the free part, All right. in terms of what that means. So our will is the exercise of everything that's a part of our, our soul, everything that's a part of us, in a direction where we can make choices and decisions 
moment by moment. And in reality, we are actually making choices and decisions moment by moment. A lot of times we're not aware, but many times we can be aware if we chose. So there's the exercise of our will. Let's look at the free part. The free part of it is in particular in operation on the earth and or you could say in the physical form. And this particular operation is that God, the creator of the gift of this will, who's given you this gift of will, will not control the use of the will. So God does not control how you use your will. God, in fact, has no expectations at all about how you use your will. Because God, God doesn't give you a gift and then take away half of the gift. Uh, so God doesn't give you the gift of will and then say to you, you're only allowed to use it this way. That, that, that's not a gift anymore. It's, it's now out of harmony. So God has no control, no expectations about how you use this gift. And God does not force you to use your will in a certain direction. So any type of religion or government or whatever it is, anything to do with society, who does any of these things are out of harmony with the gift itself. Because God doesn't do these particular things. Now I'm not saying that God then allows you to be an anarchist. Because just because God does all of those things, it doesn't mean that there is no consequence for the way in which you make choices and decisions. So we need to understand the difference between God not controlling the use of your will, having no expectations about the use of your will, having no force upon the use of your will, and the difference between that and there being laws and consequences. Because there are two, they are two different things. But in this regard... You could say, while on earth, and this applies, I'll just write that there, while on earth, God does not control the use of your will. God does not expect that you use your will in any direction. God does not force you to use your will. You know, there's no, like, swearing at God and then God going, oh, I shouldn't have used your will that way. I strike you, I smite you. And this is why none of those things occur, because God has none of these particular expectations of you. While you're on earth, there is no control, no expectation, no force. Once you pass into the spirit world, there is the consequences of the expression of your will on earth. And so there are times when you are or will be controlled in the spirit world, in the sense that you'll have to go to a certain location in the spirit world that matches the condition of love in your soul. And there is no option to not go there. Eventually. When I say eventually, usually we spend a lot of time on earth hoping we can still live on earth and after a while we give that up after we've passed. And at that point, we are forced to go to a location in the spirit world that matches the condition of our soul through what's called the law of attraction. So there is a restriction once we pass that wasn't present while we're on earth. See, while on earth, we can live in a mansion and be an evil drug lord, <laughs> can't we? On the, in the spirit world, you can't live in a mansion and be an evil drug lord at the same time. Uh, you can learn to live in a mansion by becoming a nice, loving individual, or you stay the evil drug lord and you won't have a mansion. That's, the, uh, that's the, how it is in the spirit world. On earth, you have a free expression of will. So an evil drug lord can live in a mansion. Uh, and, and a beautiful, loving person can live in a hovel. Uh, in the spirit world, that doesn't happen either. A beautiful, loving person has a mansion. <laughs> right? not, not a hovel. So, on earth, there is this free or freedom about the expression of our will in that we're not forced to go where God, th where God feels we should be, perhaps, because in the end, in the spirit world, that's where we end up. But we don't, we're not forced to go there. We have the choice. We have choices and decisions to make 
and we're allowed to feel the full consequences of such choices and decisions. It's not forced upon us that we will have to do something different. So, so this is the freedom we have while on earth. But this freedom does not mean that there are no consequences. Because the reality is, there's a consequence for every single choice and decision we make. It's just that the majority of the time, we are not sensitive to the consequence. You can become sensitive to the consequence. But for the majority of us, we're not sensitive to the consequences. But there is a consequence for how we use the choices and decisions we make. Now, if I can draw it this way. If our choices and decisions are in harmony with love, then the consequence will always be joy, happiness, and pleasure. If the, con the choices and decisions we make are out of harmony with love, so there's no love in them, then the consequences will be pain, suffering, and unhappiness. So just if we have the mic over there just behind. Yeah, no, you're right behind. Thanks. So how free are we really then? If uh, if you choose to be unloving, then you can't be unloving and have happiness. So how free are you? Well, I would argue, if my argue is you're still free. You can make any choice you want. But you won't be happy. But you won't be happy. Yep. And to me, uh, it's a very good system, that is, actually. Because that, that also gives me the ability, through my own unhappiness, to see that I must have made some choices that were out of harmony with love. Mm. It's a feedback system, if you like. But God allows us to make these choices. And we can make choice after choice after choice after choice. And by the way, when I say pain and suffering, the pain and suffering may not be immediate. Just like the joy and happiness and pleasure may not be immediate. All right? In other words... You might make a choice that you thought was great today, but, but was driven by selfishness. And down the track, you reap the consequence of unhappiness as a result of that choice, even while today you thought it was a great thing to do. Yeah. Right? And many murderers fall into that category. They think murdering someone is a great thing to do today. Yeah. And then, of course, when they get caught and punished, they then think maybe it wasn't such a great thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, in the spirit world, is it much more obvious... Uh, what your condition of love is. Of course. So that's why, why I'm confused. So if you're a celestial spirit and you're kind of glowing, yep. and so it's very obvious that you're in this great place, yep. when you go down to talk to all these like, people that are really struggling, yep. aren't they just like, oh, obviously this person knows, knows the truth and I should follow, follow their teachings because they're glowing and I'm in this horrible condition? Yes, but to, to actually assess the difference between yourself and someone else, you've got to have awareness Self-awareness and awareness of the other person. You think of, the, of people on earth today, the majority of people have no awareness of the, their next door neighbour. No awareness of their condition, no awareness of what, how happy or unhappy they are, because we block ourselves to awareness. We even block ourselves to awareness of our own condition. Yeah. So the reality is a lot of times our own condition can be even quite dark on earth, and, and we block our awareness to it. And that is a choice... And that's a choice also that many spirits take. They make the same choice. But do they, do they see the, the glowingness? Yeah, they'll see the person glowing and they'll go, why does he glow for? <laughs> yeah. Right? No, He's just no, some no. weak, no good person. You know, like that, that's the judgment they might have. Uh, you, know, it, you know, he's all gentle. You know? <laughs> you know, he, he only has one partner. Like, that's not a good thing. You know, you need okay. to, you know, so they have all of their own belief systems assessing that individual. Does that make sense? Or they go, they start talking to the person and the person tells them, yeah, I'm joyful because I've been born again. And they go, what? This religious crap again? I don't want to hear anything about religious crap, you know? And so they judge the individual who's become happy and joyful through their own use of their own will. Yeah. 
And if you think about it, we do that every single day. Most yeah. of us do that every single day on Earth, where, where somebody can come to us with a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, material that could help our life, and we will judge them. We'll go, oh, you know, it's not worth listening to. You know, that's, and oftentimes our judgments are based around what's happened in our past. So, so if we've grown up in a very harsh religious environment, for example, we'll, every time we hear the word God, yeah. we just go, whoa, you know, like run the other way as far as we can go. Not only that, many of us stand up and say, wow, dear, you're talking to me about God. Mm -hmm. And all of our own emotional, you know, things that we've absorbed through our life have a large impact on our awareness our ability to actually hear and see and feel other people. Mm. Yeah. So if you arrived in the spirit world and you had all those judgments of religion, for example, and some guy comes along who's bright, bright, bright and glowing... I just thought you're so obvious. ...and happy, and you look at him and say, you're really happy, I'd like to know why you're so happy, tell me what... You're so. And he, says, he starts talking about God, and you say, I don't want to hear about God. <laughs> it's <laughs> you just know so stupid. It might seem stupid, but that's what we do on Earth every single day, oh, isn't it? I know it? that, because yeah. we are stupid, so that's why we do it. Yeah, so, so our reality is that we, you know, obviously to be able to assess the condition of other people who are talking to us, there needs to be a large degree of openness inside of ourselves. There needs to be a large degree of open-mindedness inside of ourselves. And the majority of people on the planet have no openness and very little open-mindedness, if you think about it. And so, of course, they struggle with any assessment of another person who they should listen to or would be very helpful to listen to, but they don't listen to at all. Yeah, Marcus? And if we come across here. Oh, if we go here first, sorry. Um, in relation to that, I, I live in Glastonbury um, and has a whole bunch of people with different views. And in the shop the other day, I shared I was coming to see you and I described you as truthful and loving and compassionate and all the rest of it. And I got asked, what does he transmit? <laughs> as though that was proof of your soul condition. And I just wondered if you had a comment on that. Because people have said they've been to see teachers that transmitted energy. And they were like, wow, this is, you know. Yeah, this whole idea of transmitting energy is very fa facade based. So, for example, if... If I am very aware of your emotional injuries, so let's say one of your emotional injuries, just a, uh, this is just not your real emotional injuries, it's just an example. It, let's say one of your emotional injuries is you badly need men to feel that you're sexually attractive. Right? And it doesn't matter what man you meet, if he doesn't feel you're sexually attractive, you don't like him. Let's say. Right? Now, if I could feel that from you and decided to transmit to you, the feeling that you're sexually attractive, wouldn't I be, be just feeding your addiction? You would feel good. And, uh, and potentially I might get something from you as a result of helping you feel good. But in the end, is that transmission of energy loving? And I would suggest it's not. Yeah, I mean, I felt that, that like you said, it was facade and probably spirit influence as well. So you can't be clear on that, but I found it, I struggled to explain that to them because they... The wall is down. And exactly. It's Most uh, new age people, people in the new age face, if you can call them those, because that's what they really are, um, they have this viewpoint of the transmission of energy is the, is the thing. And they don't care even really where it comes from. It could be coming from a person who's just trying to manipulate them. It could be coming from a person who's really dark in the spirit world, who's using the person on earth to transmit energy through. It could be coming from all sorts of sources that they don't really care as long as they feel good. Mm -hmm. And I suggest to you that a person who makes you feel good at all times is not loving you because, uh, because they, they are obviously pandering to most of your emotional injuries and addictions to make you feel good. And, and that's, that's not empowering either, is Not it? empowering. So it's thing. also not demonstrating or helping you understand that where you're wanting certain things from people and dependent on people giving you those things. The way God created us with will is that we can be individuals that nobody else on this planet loves and still be loving. We can be individuals that nobody else on the planet cares about and still care for everyone around us. That, that's how God created us. We are not dependent on the flow of emotion from other people in order to be happy. That's the reality. 
And this is one of the beautiful gifts of free will, is that free will enables us to get into this state, eventually, where we are not dependent on what everybody thinks of us, what everybody does around us, what everybody wants me to do, all those kind of things, how everyone makes me feel. We are independent of that. And that, when you think about it, is one of the best places you could ever be. Because now you are engaging you, your will, and if you do it in a loving way, you'll never have any negative painful results and neither will anyone around you have any negative painful results from that actions of, that you take. So my suggestion to people is if they are addicted to the transmission of feelings from one person to another, and a lot of these so-called gurus who are overcloaked most of the time by spirits are transmitting energy. They, the spirits feel what kind of energy the individual wants and then transmit that energy to that individual. And of course the person is getting their addictions met so they feel good but at the end of the day it's been no good for their soul development, no good for their relationship with God, no good for their personal development, no good for their relationships and, and that's not love also. Yeah. And it is hard when you're speaking with such people who believe in such things because they, that's all they're focused on. I remember one talk I gave in... in in, you know, this was about seven years ago or six years ago in Australia to a group of people who were only interested in the transmission of energy which was an interesting uh, I, I think I need to bring talk. you to Glastonbury I'll, I'll give them a shot <laughs> <laughs> well it's a very common uh, new agey type of concept isn't it this, con this concept of energy transmission to make other people feel certain things and it, while, it, while you can manipulate people that way it's not loving to <coughs> manipulate people. So I feel it's far better to just state the truth to people and let them make up their own mind rather than me transmitting a whole heap of feelings to them while they're trying to make up their own mind. If you think about it, it's, it's just the opposite of a person who gets angry with you. A person who's angry with you is trying to force your will into their concept of where you should take it. That, that's the reason why they're angry, right? They're trying to force your will to conform to whatever they believe. A person who's just giving you nice feelings is doing exactly the same thing. Trying to force your will into a direction they want to take it. They've just learnt to use the carrot instead of the stick. That's the only difference. I would, I would suggest it's still not loving. It's still an unloving process. Yeah. yeah. If we come across to Marcus, who's got the mic, and then to here. Hi. Um, I just wondered if you could if you had a definition for love, because you talk about loving all the time and all that kind of stuff, and it's not terribly clear to me. Uh, you talk about being in harmony with love and out of harmony with love. I'm talking um, about God's love when I say that. So, okay. yeah. And I have defined God's love quite a number of times in other talks. And I've put... There's nearly a thousand hours of talks on the, on the YouTube. I know it's hard to find them. Um, so what we're, what we're starting to do now is we're starting to do a whole series of smaller FAQs, we're calling them, where a person asks a question and I give a direct answer to that one question and we put that as one video on YouTube and pretty shortly we'll be doing a whole series of questions about God and God's love and, and so, so that you can see, feel the qualities of God's love. We, uh, I also want to give a talk very soon about the qualities of God's love, how to recognise the qualities of God's love. But, but if you listen to the discussion about the qualities of God's truth, you'll find it's very similar to be the same qualities with God's love. So my suggestion is to firstly watch that video. It's an old video and the sound is not good. Um, but um, there is a document that I've written that might be easier called The Qualities of Divine Truth. And my suggestion would be to read that because many of the qualities of God's love or divine love are similar to the qualities of divine truth. Yep. Yep. And sorry, if you, you want to say more, do that. Mary's got you down already. <laughs> she, she, she's on the boat. Just say thank you. No worries. Mm. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about spiritual attacks. Uh, I've been told that we're all working with guides and, and guardians around us. Now, since the uh, last two weeks, I've been constantly attacked by spirits. Yeah. I'm pretty much aware of they can only attack us because of our wounds. But I ask every day to also, I know where I need to work on, but it don't, they don't seem to give me the time. I mean, every day I need to go through this process now. 
which is very uncomfortable. <laughs> so Yes, it's I, not nice being attacked by people you can't see. <laughs> and it's not nice being attacked by people you can see either, by the way. <laughs> so either way, you, you want to work through whatever it is. My, my first point of call whenever I'm personally being attacked is to look at the choices and decisions that I'm making. To always look at how I'm exercising my will. Does that make sense? Yeah, he's come along to yeah, make no, you no, feel good. He's me, so <laughs> yeah, he's trying to support you. <laughs> he's very sensitive emotionally he is, he is. to how you're feeling. And, yeah. and as soon as he feels a bit of distress, bang, yeah. he's there. to. He and in fact, that's the reason why you're getting attacked. You want people, you're very open to people, uh, or you want people, there is an openness inside of you, to have people nurse you through negative situations to help you through negative situations, rather than take full self-responsibility for the situation. As a result of that, that makes you very open to spirit's influence. And many of these spirits, therefore, are easily able then to attack you as a result. So it's quite easy for, you, for a person to attack you because you're open to hearing them and open to listening to their influence because you desperately want them to feel good things about you. Yes. Right? Yeah. And as a result of you desperately wanting to feel good things about you, you are opening yourself to them feeling anything about you, including bad things about you. And this is what exposes you to the attack. And the little dis demonstration there of the addiction was in play when he came across to give you like, some affection, yeah. which is what you're looking for. Do you follow it's me? still hard to accept for me sometimes. <laughs> it is hard it to is, accept yeah. for you, but it's what you're looking for. Yeah. And because of that openness, spirits can just hammer you whenever they wish. Now, to get rid of it, then we need to use our choices and decisions in another direction. So, so if we use our choice to instead of, instead of feeling like I want the other person to understand me and I want the other person to, to feel good about me, feel that you don't feel good about you. Let yourself feel that. And that's what you want to avoid. Yeah. And because you want to avoid that, any person around you, whether it's on earth or in the spirit world, can tell you bad things about you and make you feel terrible about yourself as a result. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Pretty much and so. If you think about your day-to-day -day life physically, this is what's happening physically sometimes. You get told bad things about you and you feel terrible as a result. And... And so what you do now is you avoid people telling you bad things about yourself. So any person who's told you a bad thing about yourself in the past, you just stay away from them. But you can't stay away from the spirits that are with you because they can follow you anywhere. Yeah. And that's why you're still open to the attack. Yeah. Yeah, that's a clear answer for me, thank you. Yeah. So, so remember, every time we're pay having pain and suffering, so this is an example of pain and suffering, it's an indication that our will is being used some, in a way that's not loving. So the way it's not loving is that we have a desire that other people make us feel good about ourselves. That's our will being used in a direction that's not loving because it's a demand upon other people that they do something for us. right? And as a result of that, it leaves us open and exposed to other people also attacking us, which is the feedback system, the pain, is a feedback system telling us something's wrong with the way I am doing something here. Does that make sense? So what we find, and it's interesting, just myself and Mary have been talking about this the last few days, haven't we, darling? And, and, and Mary and I are often uh, feel the bombardment of emotions of thousands of people at the same time, right? And as a result of the bombardment of emotions, my reaction is very different to Mary's. Mary's reaction is she feels like she's got to listen to everybody. <laughs> That's her reaction. And she's got to listen to everybody because, you know, if she doesn't, there might be something bad that happens that she didn't know about or, you know, it's all to do, a lot of it's to do with fear. So, so what happens is when I get this bombardment, I hardly notice it at all. And when Mary gets the bombardment, she feels terrible and down and feels like, what's going on now? Does that make sense? And so what, just because of the two different attitudes, the, the openness, we get a whole different response from pain and suffering to joy and happiness. So my happiness is not depleted when other people do that to me, whereas Mary's happiness is depleted. And that's an indication that something inside of you is a choice and decision out of harmony with the loving use of your will. In this case, for Mary, the, the lovingness towards herself. 
right? So, so remember that the, use, the loving use of free will involves lovingness towards yourself, loving towards others, loving towards God. So there's all sorts of loves involved there in terms of how we use our free will. Yep. Hello. Um, I, I can see myself making a, a mental conscious decision to want to act in harmony with love. Yep. But my habits are so ingrained that I'm automatically and unconsciously drawn to act in a way that is not loving. So, and can I can I stop you there for a moment? This is the thing that's so important to understand. We, you know, we feel that most people don't understand exactly what you've just stated that you now at least understand, and that is that that just because you have an intellectual desire to do something in harmony with love, it doesn't mean it's a soul-based desire yet, because your soul is leading you in a, another direction. So continue. Uh. Well, well, my conditioning, I, would th I call it my conditioning, my ingrainedness, my stuff that I've inherited from my parents and ancestors as well as my growing up has created me to predominantly act, think and feel in an unloving manner, even though I now consciously wish to move in the direction of more and more love or acting more in harmony with that. But the utter weight and inertia, and call it what you want, the treacleness of it, of living my life. That's through what it feels like. <laughs> exactly. That's <spot laughs> living through this conditioning. Yeah. How, what can I do? I mean, my intention is there. How do I go through what I need to go through to be able to more embody harmonious, loving life? All right, firstly, there are a number of ways to handle the situation. From a, um, you, you mentioned the word conditioning for a start. Let's look at conditioning. What is it from your perspective? It's... All right. Um, so it's like... I have been conditioned to think in certain ways, to have certain beliefs, to behave and feel in certain ways. By whom? Right. Uh, my whole environment, school, parents. Okay, so parents... School, yeah. Uh, TV, for example. TV, yeah. Uh, are the three things that really I'm strongly aware of as having affected me. Right, okay. So, and you've called that conditioning. In the, yes, in the sense that it's, it's more driving me than I'm driving it. Yes, I agree it is. But what you haven't seen is the reason why those particular things drive you. So why do they drive you? Any ideas? Why, why do they drive me? I don't know. I feel that I'm... Um, I just feel that I'm being driven. Sometimes I do get a sense, a body sense, that I have that I'm being driven, and because I have that sense, it lessens the me being controlled by. Yep. So bringing this sense of awareness lessens it, but I still have such, it's such an ingrained thing that it's so painful to resist the, the being driven by those conditionings. So let's look at, uh, what we want to do is step you down into what's really going on. So what you notice is the pain of being, of when you resist being driven, Yes. You feel pain, yes? Yes. And, and the pain is saying, go back to what you were doing before, basically, isn't it? It's like, go back to letting television control you, or yes, go back to yes. letting what you learn at school control you, or whatever. Yeah. So in other words, it's causing you to revert back to your conditioning. Correct. Yes. Right? And, and why do you find pain so difficult? Oh, out of fear. Okay. So, so there's pain created... And then, of course, there's this aspect of fear, right? And what I'm going to suggest to you is this is the problem for you. It's not your habits or your conditioning. It's your fear of going against your conditioning that is causing the problem. And you're not recognising or feeling how great that fear is. Okay. You follow yes, me? Yes. Yep. And this is where you're using your will, you've made a choice inside of yourself to use your will to honour your fear and call it conditioning. 
So in other words, you're actually using this term, conditioning, as a way of distancing yourself ah. from the painful emotion of fear that you're going to need to feel, which is the consequence of a long life living in fear, right? Or being, having fears put upon you. And for the majority of us, what we do is we then call it something else, we give it a term that tends to distance ourselves from the personal responsibility of feeling that emotion. So whenever I use the word conditioning, I'm basically blaming my environment for how I'm acting. In other words, I'm not taking personal responsibility for why I act the way the environment tells me to act. And that is because of fear an emotion that exists inside of me that I'm choosing to not feel. Because if I chose to feel it, I wouldn't need to act in harmony with it anymore. Does that make sense? I understand, yes. Yeah. So, so frequently what happens with free will is we give up our free will to the point where we even, we even to ourselves, tell ourselves that we didn't have will. That we don't have will. In other words, we tell ourselves that the way in which we're expressing our will is all as a result of some kind of conditioning. When the reality is, the reason why we're responding to conditioning is always because of a fear. It's always because of some fear that exists inside of us. Usually, it's an emotional fear, but it can even be a physical one. So, for example, when we were young, we might have got belted by our parents under certain circumstances, right? And our fear of violence now causes us then to act as adults in a certain direction. So whenever a similar situation comes up that what come up in our childhood when we got smacked comes up as an adult, we are so afraid of the violence that happened in the past that we choose to go along with the conditioning. So it's the fear, again, driving our desire to respond to the conditioning that is the issue. And we can make a choice or a decision to now feel this fear rather than deny its existence and blame it all on conditioning. And how do you find out? Because it makes sense to me now, but you had to be here to point it out to me. <laughs> yep. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known that. So yep. how can I find out more of the underlying things that underlie the labels that I use to cover the emotions? Can I just make it really simple for you? Every single thing that you find hard to do from a loving perspective, you know, in other words, every single, t single time you find it hard to be loving, it's only ever a fear <laughs> <laughs> driving it. Yeah. Nothing else. Right. right? So, so we could do it like this. We could, couldn't we? We could basically say the only thing we need to focus on feeling is a fear. <laughs> right? Every time that we notice ourselves intellectually doing something unloving and thinking that we're being pushed by something or someone or whatever, all it is that's really pushing us is our inability to feel our fear rather than acting to make it go away. That's the only thing that's pushing us, actually. Yeah. Now, if you take that approach, and that's the approach I take in my personal life, um, you'll find you'll find this fear, that fear, this fear, that fear, the impact that every one of these fears has on your life. And in fact, that's the reason why in discussions about fear with people, I've encouraged them to make a fear list of all of the known fears. And then every time they feel some pain or feel being pushed into an unloving direction, sit down with yourself, feel yourself, and feel, what am I afraid of here? What am I afraid of? And a lot of times you go, oh, I'm afraid of that person. I'm afraid that they will think a certain thing about me. I'm afraid that you know this person over here might harm me some way. I'm afraid that my partner, my friends, my children, my <laughs> whoever around me might treat me a certain way if I act in that manner. Right? The main reason why there's not a lot more people coming along to our seminars is because of fear. They're afraid that everyone around them will think they've joined a cult or joined a, some kind of you know crazy nutter calling himself Jesus type of thing. And so they are afraid. Right? It doesn't matter if I make a lot of sense when I speak or anything. They're just afraid. And, and it's the unwillingness to feel the fear that causes us to change our action. Now, when we're unwilling to feel our fear, yes, we are now responding to our conditioning. So, 
So now the conditioning of what happened throughout our life is going to be hugely involved in what decisions and choices we make. So, so you know, it will even go down to driving, you know, all, all sorts of daily activities that we're doing. You'll be surprised how much fear drives our conditioning. Even the route we take to work is a lot about fear. It's a lot about what's easy, what's hard. But sometimes I'm aware that I think I'm, so I'm going to the shops and I get a sense that I'm, I'm reacting to something, but I can't connect with the, the fear. So go to the shop and try to feel it there. <laughs> you know, that's what I would do. I would, act upon the, I would act upon it if I felt a sense of going to do something. Act upon it and see, but be especially sensitive to what kind of feedback I'm getting. You know, whether I'm being placed in an uncomfortable position, what kind of discomfort it is and so forth. Because remember, these are the feedback mechanisms we have to determine what's going on. So for the majority of us, feeling fear is the most uncomfortable thing we can do. Would you agree with that? For those of you who have tried to feel some fear? And, and if we f range fear from absolute terror, which the majority of people have no desire whatsoever to feel, right the way through to mild, um, you know, what would you call it? Agitation. agitation. Yeah. The kind of agitation that a good cigarette takes <laughs> away. <right? laughs> um, then, then, that, then in between that range, there is a large amount of fear that affects our day-to-day -day lives. And we do have a tendency to give it a different name. That tends to alleviate the personal responsibility of dealing with it. So in other words, when we call it conditioning, we're basically saying, oh, but somebody else made it. But the problem is, is the fear exists within our soul and it's only the choices and decisions we make that are going to release it. In other words, it's only going to be the exercise of our will that causes its release. So if I'm using my will to shut down my fear, to control it, to keep it under wraps, to deny it, to use words or terminologies that, that make it go away, then my fear is never going to be felt and I'll be driven by it constantly. It'll be become my motor. It's like wherever you go, you, you turn on the motor of fear and that's where you go. You know? That's where you're going to go every single time. Whereas once we realise that this is just a feeling that can be felt and we can use our choices and decisions, we can use our will as a, in a loving manner to feel it, once we make that choice, this all we realise it's got nothing to do with the conditioning. It's got everything to do with our ability to let go of those, let go of our fears. And in fact, in your day-to-day -day progression, the only thing that stops you, or usually the only thing that stops most people from being loving, is fear. That's usually the thing that stops us from being loving. So it's very important to see that. Yeah. Um, would it be reasonable to say that, let's say um, you were born into a very, very, very unloving household. Mm -hmm. Let's say there was religious dogma, there was physical abuse, it was bad, yeah. okay? Yeah. You're going to grow up with a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. So could you say that their free will is in a way, to an extent, limited because it's so much more difficult for them to make loving choices than from someone who's been born into a really loving family, who's made it clear to them you know, what God's love is and they follow in the divine the truth path. And yeah, well, I, I actually find it almost the opposite to that. What I've found a lot of times is that people who have been brought up in very unloving environments often at least have a consciousness that they need to fix something in order to make their lives better. And as a result of that, they become more self-aware and then as a, in the process of becoming more self-aware, they notice their fear. And so what I often find is it's, it's the people who have lived a relatively normal life that struggle when it comes to their relationship with God and also struggle many times with their growth in love because they've received a whole heap of things that they think are normal mm. that are not necessarily normal or loving 
and they view them as because there's no there has been very little what appears to be pain created they live in that life in a very self-satisfied and 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 lack self analysis and so i feel that it just depends really on on the individual, on the individual and the use of their will choices. their choices and decisions yeah it's just because I've met some people that are brought up in terrible households yeah. and they're very nice people. But um, yeah. cause I'm a, I teach religious education, actually, at a school. Yep. And so most of the children who tend to be, um, you know, have problems or aggressive or whatever, you can usually 99% of the time trace it back to something going on the f in the family. So I agree. But uh, let's just for a moment have a short discussion about children versus parents, shall we? Or, or children versus adults. All of these discussions that I'm having with you about will are really referring to adults. Okay. Because the reason why it's a little bit different for children is because children's will is largely defined by the will of their parents as they are formulating their life. So from the ages in particular, from the time they are born to seven years of age, their, their formative processes and their intellect is being developed. And as a result of that, whatever the adults in, the, you know, in their environment do to them or say to them or feel towards them, they begin to reflect. Mm -hmm. When you take them out of that environment and put them in a different environment, you can get them to reflect some different things as a result of that. And the reason why this is the case is because children are often reflecting their environment. And therefore, they, are, they don't have a developed sense of their will. So that's very different to us as an adult where we've left home, we're now, you know, basically our life is under our personal decisions and control compared to a child who's still being, you could say, disciplined by its parent into a certain way of thinking or feeling. Now, the problem that we have as a society is that we would, it would be preferable that we release the children from all of these negative influences. Which we do sometimes. Right, which would be fantastic, right? To release them in particular from all of the, the unloving choices that we ourselves as adults make. However, for that to occur, we as adults must learn how to use our will in harmony with love mm. before the children will be able to respond to such a thing. And this is why it's so important that we focus on the adults first in terms of developing will. And this will help the children be free to develop a sense of their own will at a much younger age and also be able to then not be infected by the environment in which they live. Although, although I must point out one thing, and that is this. The children tell us how unloving we are through their behaviour and actions. So in other words, they are almost a feedback system that God has designed. And if we are in unwilling to change ourselves for the sake of our children, then it's highly unlikely we will be, un we will be willing to do it for anyone, including ourselves. So, so what I suggest is that it, look at what's happening to our children, be willing to see the direct relationship between what we do as adults and how it affects our children, and then help our children, if they're, they're not living in our own home, in your case at a school or whatever you're teaching, um, they're coming from other homes, help your children engage their free will, but understand they have limitations because their will is being already controlled by their adults in their environment and until those children release themselves from such an environment it's highly unlikely that uh, that much positive outcomes will will occur because yeah. what we'll do is give them counseling or give them therapy or in my lessons i'll be like you don't have to become like your parents or whatever but then they go back to the what we'd love what i'd love to do is get the adults in and then just you know just work with them through their issues and then exactly. that would stop it at the source but exactly that's probably and if we happen. were really bold with in society we would not allow such adults to actually continue to have these children if we were really bold we wouldn't do that what we would do instead 
is we place them in a temporary loving environment while we work on the adults and their unloving behaviour. And then once the adults want to be loving to their own children, then say, here's your children back, be loving to them this time, you know. Um, but we are afraid of that as a society. And one of the reasons why is because we have huge definitions as a society of what it means to be a parent. And they're my children. You know, we have a deep degree of ownership over children as parents. And this ownership that we have is terrible with our children, actually. Because what it means is that there are many people on the planet who still believe that it's okay to kill your child under certain circumstances. And, and by the way, when I say many, there are millions of people on this planet who believe that this is okay to be able to kill your child under certain circumstances where they don't agree with your beliefs. Like honour killings, for example. An honour killing is killing a child for, some, for, a th for a thing that they have done that didn't agree with your beliefs, right? And, and so many of us are willing to go to that extent in order to force our will upon our children. And that means that many of us are willing to believe that we own them, that they are ours, that we have the right to determine what they do. And that is not true. They are brothers and sisters of ours, in other words, we are all children of God and they are our, our so-called children are really our brothers and sisters. And we do not have the right to harm their free will choices like we do. But many parents, the majority on the planet actually, believe they do have that right. And until that changes, things are really not going to change in terms of children being happy. But if we remember that any discussion about free will, we, we have to speak first to the adults. <laughs> And in fact, in your case, um, if we were really focused on fixing the problem, we would not shy away f from addressing the adults. And in fact, as society, we would say, no, this is all the problem of the adults. And in fact, almost every teacher that I've ever spoken to says, I am tired of dealing with problems that come from the adults in the, at, in the home environment, right? And, and so they're trying to fix up the effects in the child when the cause is, as you say, the adults who are damaging the child. It would be far more effective in an environment to fix the cause, which is the adults. And, but all of us are afraid of biting that off because of how much rage and other emotions you'll get from the adults when that's bitten off, right? And so what we do is we try to do our best with the child, which is just the effect-based problem, rather than fixing the thing with the adult. Yeah. And this is the thing we need to understand even as a society, that the choices and decisions we make as a society affect every child that comes into the world. Every new soul that comes into the world is affected by these choices and decisions. And this is why we need to talk more about what is the loving use of our will yeah, in terms of how, what we do. I just, uh, just really, just saying the same thing really about if, if children are born into like starvation or third world countries, yep. uh, I mean, they don't really have much will <laughs> or much I agree. sense of a free will anyway. I agree. Uh, and I think a lot of people feel that, well, there isn't such a thing as free will because there's so many people on the planet who haven't got free will, i.e. children. I agree. You know, uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously up to the age of seven where they're developing... Will, and even in the third world, more. sometimes they never have any sense of will for yeah. the rest of their life. Yeah. So I think that's the, you know, it's just backing up what you're saying really there. But yeah, I but think can it's we, important for people. We can even go further that. than what I've said in terms of look at it from a national perspective, from a nation and nation based perspective. The reality is we have so called the third world because the Western world are making certain choices and decisions and have done for thousands of years. So, for example, your, your own nation has been a conquering of the world type of nation in the past. Is that agreed? And there are still nations on earth that are willing to go and do this, you know, take, take over other nations, you know. The US uh, government is quite okay with some of this, depending on whether they see their personal wealth being affected. Now, if you look at what's happening on a nation-by-nation -nation basis, when we look at the third world what we call the third world. Let's call them the world's poor. The reason why they don't have enough resources is because the world's 
rich have enforced their will upon those. So the whole reason why this particular problem has occurred is because the world's rich have not had a loving use of their will. Because if they really loved the world's poor, they wouldn't use their will in the direction that's currently being used. Now, we also in Western countries need to see our personal part in this because we vote in, usually, the people who make these choices and decisions. So we need to see how the choices and decisions we make, which are often economically based. In other words, if, if you, for instance, here in England, had a government decide they were going to give away half of your country's wealth to the third world. How many people do you think would vote for that government at the moment? See, there might be a few, but the majority of people go, but what does that mean about my wealth? That means my wealth might be halved. What? <laughs> Surely there's another solution. And, uh, and so oftentimes we would not support, individually support, a government making such a choice or decision. Right? And it is our... So really what that gets down to then, if we start taking away the rich as the cause of the decision, it really comes down to our personal decision as to why the poor exist. Doesn't it? Really, when you come think about it collectively. It's our personal decision. Our personal decisions currently create the world's poor. Well, one of the um, comments what I often get is, uh, you're not going to change worlds, you know. Well, you get that all the time. Well, <laughs> and one I, say, I think that you can do of course. by, by use, use of your free will, basically. Well, and, you, and, and everybody else. Look, let's look historically. A um, hundred years ago here in England, were women allowed to vote? When was it that the vote actually came in for women here in England? Does any of, do any of you know? 1918 or somewhere. It was, it was somewhere near the First World War, right? So, so before then, women were not considered to be any people that would be willing to be or even able to be involved in the government of the land. Now, that changed. How did it change? Throw herself under a horse. Throw herself under a horse. By people using their personal decisions to change their choices and decisions into be more harmonious with love. Now, some of those harmonious with love, is, they, they weren't that harmonious with love. They went into rebellion, and that's not harmonious with love. But if every man in England in 1914 decided, through the use of their will, that women are just as equal as men, would there, would there have ever been a woman that needed to throw herself under a horse in order to get a vote? No. So this is where, again, it gets back to the loving use of our will. If collectively and individually we use our will in a loving manner, there will always be change. Always. And change is inevitable, in fact, while we use our will in a loving manner. I read an article just uh, this week in one of your newspapers about the trouble that the Anglican Church is having losing members. So what they've done is the Anglican Church did a survey of the, of the people who have left their church and found that the majority of the people who left their church still believed in God. And the majority of people who left their church still believed in the Bible. They just could not agree with the way in which the church was instigating many of the principles that came from the Bible and so they could no longer go along to church. That's people using their will in a loving manner to show the, in this case, the institution of the church that the way they are using their will is in an un unloving manner. And none of them have attacked the church or been violent against the church or burnt the church or done any of these things. It's not a very English thing to do with those things. <laughs> right? But, but they've gone ahead and exercised it through the use of their will just in terms of making a choice whether they go or not. And that is causing the church to look and decide what they're going to do with that, how they're going to change. So I don't agree that we can't change the world. 
But I've, and I feel quite strongly, in fact, that it's essential that we all understand we can change the world. But we can only do it by changing our personal decisions and choices to bring them into more harmony with love. Right. It's the only way we can do it. Yep. If we go up the back there, thanks. <coughs> uh, yeah, go, going back to uh, free will, like, um, do you have, first of all, hi, how are you? Good, <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Good. You, so if you hold good. your mic up just a bit closer, Sorry. that's <laughs> very good. Um, I was wondering about uh, free will. I, I saw uh, a couple of times, actually, in the space of about a week, so I think it was definitely an injury of mine that was being right in my face, where I saw um, a child basically being really, really screamed at by their parents in a public space, uh, and they were being very verbally and actually really shaking the child. And what would you suggest one would do in this sort of situation? What are you afraid of doing? Uh, taking the child away from the situation. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we have to do. Okay. And, I know, I, and at first I would just go up to the parent and say, look, I, I don't know what's upsetting you or whatever else, mm. but, but this is not the way to treat your child. And if they project their rage at me rather than child, well, that's good. At least yeah. I'm an adult and I can handle that. Um, I, I feel we are afraid of doing such things because of our beliefs about parents and children. We believe that parents own their children and so therefore have the right to treat their children in any way. Of course, we draw the line when they've become physically or sexually abusive, but, but in between that line and the line of actual verbal abuse and everything else, and also a large degree of violent abuse, we will tolerate. We need to, as a society, make a different choice that we will no longer tolerate violent, sexual or verbal abuse even with each other <laughs> that's what we need to do as a society to make the choice to be different the majority of us uh, would under those circumstances be quite afraid and and in fact probably would also incur the wrath of other people besides the parent and uh, as a result of that the majority of us have been conditioned through our fear to not act and that's where we're using our will to conform. Yep. And so this is, again, the loving use of will. We want to talk more about this use of will in terms of conforming and conformance because it's a very big problem that we have on the planet. Conforming our will to suit a large number of other people and when we know for certain that their actions and the general consensus is that those actions are not very loving. And yet we still go along with conforming. And we do it because we're afraid. It's always the fear that bites us in the end, you know? <laughs> yeah. if, uh, Perry? If you... The first time, the first time loving with spirit is back and that the people you love with spirit is a fixer world. Uh, with spirit, the thing is being hitting the world with spirit and they are your system, but to make a change in the third world. The loving, you expect to get that for spirit as well as our homes and our fam families. It's back to get for the impossible one. Now, if you can just pause a moment and Mum can interpret for me. That would be good. <laughs> yeah, um, ben said, if we have loving respect, yes, we, would, we will change the world yep. in our homes and in our families. Yep. So it's about everyone having loving respect for everyone. Is yep. that what you said? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's very true, Ben. It's very true. And the problem is for the majority of us is that we're so governed by fear that, we d that even respect goes out the window whenever fear comes up, isn't it? That's the real problem we face. Yep. Okay. So we're right up to there. So we write that the loving use of our free will is obviously going to have an effect in the world. It's going to have an effect in our personal life. And remember, we, where we left the discussion so far was we had choices that were loving were eventually going to result in pleasure. And choices that are unloving would eventually result in pain. And the fact that we've got a lot of pain on the planet usually indicates that there's a lot of choices being made 
that are unloving in their nature. Pleasure and pain are short-term results and eventually turn into longer-term things. So pain eventually turns into suffering. And in fact, eventually turns into death, does it not, for the majority of us. Pleasure, joy, life, all the opposites, that all come from the different exercise of our will. So in any discussion that we have about this, we need to do with some practical issues, really, about how we go about uh, changing the world around us and changing ourselves so that the choices that we make are more loving, that we use our will in a direction that is much more loving than we currently do. And seeing the responsibility, because these results are our personal responsibility. We were asked a few weeks ago, um, if I thought I was Jesus was the question, right? Why is it that if I thought I'm Jesus, that I don't have a, a, a sort of a plan for the world in terms of what the world should do or what I'm going to teach the world? And this uh, question is often asked by, by members of the media or others because they want me to force the world somehow to, to make changes. And in fact, they go so far as to quote a heap of Bible verses to me, right? And the Bible verses are along the lines of, when Jesus comes, he will arrive in a white horse with a whole big army and he'll get rid of the wicked and he'll have the righteous saved and he'll make everything on earth beautiful and everything will happen just because Jesus wills it. Uh, is it David? Well, when I read that in the Bible when I was younger, I used to think, well, he's going to come spiritually, you know. With his army. Yep, well, some, some of them go that direction, but the majority of Christians I've spoken to go in the physical direction. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I'm in a Baptist church at the moment because I thought I need to be baptised. Yeah. And I can sit there sometimes and it's like treading through treacle. Yeah. And I, I've said to them, I'm going to see a man who claims to be Jesus. And they said, oh, well, ask him this and ask him that. <laughs> I thought, well, why don't you come Why don't yourself? you come along and ask? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So... Can I point out, though, that uh, the reason why people believe in these Bible verses is because they want somebody else to make the changes that they've been unwilling to make. They want somebody else to be responsible for their own choices and decisions. It's a disclamation. It's a, it's an, it's a way of absconding from their own choices and decisions. It's a way of getting away with making choices and decisions and then hoping somebody else comes along and fixes them all for you. Now, God has created a universe in which he, God, is not going to come along and fix your problems for you. Now, the reason why God's doing that is because he understands that every problem we have is a result of how we exercised our will, either individually, individually or collectively. Right? And so... Any person who's truly connected to God would never come along and try to force another person to change their will. So it's impossible for Jesus or any other person on this planet who really loves God and actually engages the process of love themselves to force a group of people into change. It's impossible for them to go to war to force a change. And the Bible claims that such a war will occur, but it will not. Because it's impossible for such a war to occur. If the person is loving, they would never engage such a thing. And the reason why we want that is the problem. We want other people to be responsible for our own choices and decisions. In other words, we don't want to become free, responsible people. We want other people to be responsible for what happens to our lives. And you see this a lot in society, don't you? Both in Western and in other societies. You see this constant requirement that many of us have of our government to make the government responsible for our life or make our religion responsible for our life. We even get down to making Jesus responsible for our life. You know, like we believe in the blood of Jesus and all of our sins have been washed away. Um, 
that is making someone else responsible for the choices and decisions you've made in your life. Now, God doesn't agree with such things. But God wants you, each individual, to be completely self-aware, self-sufficient and self-responsible. In other words, how you use your will, understanding that, is going to have a huge impact on the changes that happen in your personal life, but also the changes that happen globally. And this is where we all need to come to that understanding, that it's only how we use our personal will that is going to change anything in the long run. Right. Yeah. I just said I was shopping the other day. Now, I know this is a little thing, but I was looking at the apples, and they're all from South Africa. And I thought, well, I want to buy some from Britain, because yeah. they don't have to fly all the way around the world then. Yeah. But I couldn't find any. You so. couldn't find any apples from Britain? No. <laughs> really? <laughs> no. Well, well, oh, yes, shopping. of course it is the wrong season. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't... Uh, see, I'm not against technology per se in terms of what it brings to us and um, it brings us many benefits and can bring the entire world many benefits like food you grow here could be given to the third world for example food sometimes in australia we burn our wheat rather than send it overseas because it costs too much to send it somewhere and there's not enough return and as a result they finish up burning uh, the crops or feeding it to the cattle instead and this is all sad decisions that we make because we're unwilling to make a different choice that's more loving, right? And, and I feel that we can also design technology that enables this process rather than using more and more and more and more and more of the world's resources. We are clever enough to do these things. But the problem is we spend so much of our money on designing ways to destroy ourselves that there's very little left to design ways to help us. Almost one third of the Western world economies are based upon arms production and arms manufacture and weaponry and defence. And if you add all up th that money all up, and in particular get all the scientists that are working on how to destroy ourselves <laughs> and put them into places of how to help us, all the physicists, all the scientists, all the chemists, all focused on, on a direction of assistance of the world, then you could see there'd be a huge change in the way in what happens on the world. And we could get apples from Africa and get it in a way that's efficient and economical and benefits both the person in Africa and us. But uh, unfortunately, we're not going to do that until we learn how to use our will in a loving direction. It always gets back down to these decisions that we make. And... And this is why it's such an important topic. You see, the way myself and Mary feel it is, God ha here on earth has given us a choice. And the choice is, exercise your will in a loving direction and see what the results will be. Or, exercise your will in an unloving direction and see what the results will be. Now, we as humanity have investigated exhaustively, I believe, but perhaps not as exhaustively as most of us need, the, the use of our will in an unloving direction. Because we've had pain and suffering for now, like millennia, and that pain and suffering is growing for, it's so large now that one third of our entire population on earth struggles to get enough to eat every day. That's a lot of suffering. And, and yet we still don't have enough motivation to change the use of our will. And this is something that we need to all consider. And, and for us in the Western world in particular, we need to consider it. Because what we decide to do here affects not just one other person in the poorer countries of the world, but it can affect hundreds of people. Just one person's individual choice can affect hundreds of people in the poorer countries. Because what they need to live on is much less than what we spend usually in the week on entertainment. Right? What they need. So this gets down to our choices again, our, whether we're going to choose things to do things lovingly or not. But it has to be a voluntary choice. It can't be forced upon us because then somebody's manipulating our will in another direction, which would also be unloving. It has to be something that we choose to do voluntarily. So God is basically saying to us, volunteer to use your will in a loving way. And then 
you will see beautiful results. At the moment, most of us are volunteering to use our will in some unloving ways. And of course, we're going to have negative results, not only for ourselves, but also for other countries. And I don't believe that technology is the problem. I believe that our use of our will is the problem. Right? We can use our will in a lot of different positive directions if we chose to, but we don't choose to. That's our problem. So I feel it all gets down to this basic thing. We've had the experiments in suffering. I think we're pretty good at those experiments and we've seen the results. Generally, personally, we've seen them, but also in society and in the world. We see the results of this kind of thing. In fact, we see the results so much that the majority of us now don't even believe that suffering is not possible. <laughs> right? But what I'm saying is that can all be released from society and the world just by choosing to exercise your will in harmony with love. That's how it's going to be released. And then there will be subsequent results, which will be all to do with those kind of things. Does that make sense? If we go over here. Hi, I'm a bit confused. Um, and I'm having difficulty actually putting my finger on how I'm confused. Okay. But I'll try and work it out as I go along. Um, it's to do with uh, pain and whether pain has a value and how we experience pain. Now, for example, um, if I choose to face something that I'm afraid of and relive an experience that I've had in the past, yep. then I experience pain. Um, and I don't... Uh, and yet, in terms of what I've been watching... I'm encouraging that. Yep. Yeah. But yet, just now, pain was associated with uh, suffering and not being not loving. Yeah, but the, the pain that we now feel is the result of previous unloving choices. Uh, okay, so it's to do with time. Yeah, so what you're, the, the issue you're facing is the delay of what happens in terms of time. The reality is, is every choice you make today that's unloving might not be felt right today as being painful. But at some point in the future, the pain will be exposed. Uh, Does that make sense? Okay. Now, when we choose to experience that pain, we're choosing to experience the pain of the old thing, not of our new choice. In fact, the choice that we're making to experience the pain is actually going to help alleviate the reason why we chose those choices in the past. Okay. So, so understand that while we do this, we can actually choose love and experience pain. But the only way that that happens is that, is, that, is that it's old pain. It's pain that's been there for sometimes, you know, 10 decades mm -hmm. of our life that we've chosen to not be sensitive to in the past, right? We've chosen to detune ourselves from. And then when we choose to tune in, we experience the pain, right? It's far better to do that because we're now paying the penalty, if you like, of the past choices rather than adding to the penalty of the past choices. In other words, we're going to be feeling less pain than we would have if we didn't stop and continue to continue down the actions of producing further pain. So what you're worried about is the history of pain. And what I'm suggesting is when you have pain inside of your soul, it usually always comes from the previous choices that you or others have made. The key is to release that so that that doesn't determine the new choice you make. Right? And, and making that decision to release the pain or feel the pain of the old choices is actually a new loving choice, which will result in pleasure and joy in the long run. Yep. So there's the relationship between the timing of it. We need to understand that, yes, there are going to be the painful consequences of past decisions that we do need to feel it's sort of like a person avoiding guilt of their past behavior and then eventually it all catches up to them and they go okay 
I'm going to feel it now. And what they're feeling now is not the choi their new choice. They're feeling the results of their old choices. So, so in that context, um, that pain, releasing that pain is uh, a positive thing. Is a new loving choice. Yeah. A right. new exercise of the will in harmony with love right. to release the pain. To hold on to the pain, if you think about it, is an unloving choice. Because you, you, you're holding it inside of your soul. It's going to damage you. <laughs> so it's unloving towards you. Mm. But it's also going to damage others. So it's unloving towards others as well. Because you will make decisions based on that pain. Right. Which will then damage others. So choosing to experience any pain from the past is a far more loving choice that will result in joy after you've done it <laughs> than um, choosing to hold on to the pain and try to avoid it will do. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We suspect that we may be soulmates. I'm okay. not going to say that for definite because we've had so many wounds to work through that yeah, uh, we yeah. haven't got to that feeling all the time yet. But um, it's been very painful. Yeah, it's been... a. Um, you know, we do have good moments, but a lot of it can feel quite tiring and quite painful. I just wondered how this all works, especially if we are soulmates and you've got this thing going, but will free with... <laughs> yeah, where's the... Oh, sorry, if you say that into a mic. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I was just choking. I said, where is the love in all this? Because we do experience a lot of uh, painful moments. Uh, well, like what you're experiencing is the pain of the past. Right, so, so the problem when two people come together in any relationship, so let's just go through it from a relationship perspective. The problem when two people come together in any relationship is that person has a whole heap of painful past, mm. right, which comes from the painful or the unloving use of their own free will and the unloving use of pe the free will of people around them towards them which have caused this pain to enter the person, which then constructed their belief systems. So their beliefs about what is loving, they uh, constructed their thoughts even, right? But in particular, constructed many of their current emotions. And then this person, in your case, the relationship is heterosexual, so here we go, the man, he's had a painful past, Right? which we have not released when we enter this relationship, which then constructed a whole different set of beliefs, thoughts and emotions. Right. Now, depending on what this painful past was, will depend on how much of these two things are in agreement with each other. Now, when they're in agreement, everything seems to go smooth. <laughs> when they're in disagreement, then we've got like, you know, World War II or, yes, you know, a bit of that. <laughs> but in a <laughs> partnership. Yeah. And what we need to do is use our will to make the choice not to dump or control the other person through this process of releasing the painful past. The only reason why we finish up having a lot of difficulties in the relationship is that one or both wish to control the other with regard to what's occurring with the release of the painful past. In other words, we're making whole heaps of decisions and choices that we believe are right, that we believe often with our entire heart and mind, we believe are the best thing to do. And yet they could be driven by the unloving use of our will. And we're not willing to see it. Mm. So we're going to have to, when we enter a relationship of any kind, in particular a soulmate relationship, if you believe you're soulmates, you're going to have to be ready for the fact that there are going to be two completely different sets of beliefs, two completely different sets of emotions, two completely different sets of thoughts about the exact same subject. And both are going to need to be willing to see the unloving part of their own desires and passions and so forth. Now, it's usually not the case that both are willing to do that. And this is why most soulmate relationships have a lot of difficulties. Because what happens is we want to hold on to our definition of what was right and the other person's definition, which is often what we believe is wrong, 
we say, well, you're wrong. And the other person says, no, no, you're wrong. <laughs> and, and it gets down to just this basic toing and froing about who's wrong. What, it needs to, what we need to do instead of that is to see that there's a high likelihood that we're both wrong. <laughs> okay. All right? And what we really need to do is find out from God's perspective what is right. And that's a whole different ball game than just having a to and fro back and forth about what's wrong. Uh, um, so, sorry, I have to point out to you that that's not necessarily the case between us. We don't actually ar argument about the fact that whether we do things wrong or right on us. We yep. just we, we, we leave each other in, in, the wrong, in the wrong space, pretty much, I feel. But that doesn't... The pain, yeah, you know what I'm trying so, <laughs> so what's going to happen is if you do that, if you leave each other with your own space and everything, each one of you will have some pain to feel because it's old pain. You're going to have to feel it in order to grow together. You're going to have to get rid of the old pain. And the only way to get rid of the old pain is by suffering through it, by, by actually feeling it, experiencing it. You can't get rid of it any other way. You can't convince yourself out of it. You can't, you know, whatever anybody tells you, you can't zen yourself out of it. You can't yoga yourself out of it. You can't eat yourself out of it, although many people would like to believe that. You can't chocolate yourself out of it or alcohol yourself out of it or coffee yourself out of it or tea yourself out of it. You have to feel it if you're really going to release it. And, and that's why it's painful. It's going to be painful while that happens. So, so don't think that if you meet your soulmate, it's all going to be just all, all roses. And, and perhaps we should use a different flower than roses because roses have thorns. But, um, you know, what, what kind of... All carnations, shall we say. Um, where everything's just rosy and, and, and smells lovely and whatever. That's not how it's going to be. It's going to be quite rough while each of us are, are confronting our painful past. The beautiful choice we can make is to be willing to do that and stay together while we do that, working our way through it and always honouring the other person's desire to do that as well, encouraging That's, that's what we're trying to do. We've moved, we have moved forward a bit. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, we're trying to find that, that more of that honouring because initially the first thing is was quite crazy for a while and then... It will yeah. be, yes. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're still here. <laughs> yeah. Well, what happens initially is that two people get together. There might be a small honeymoon period. <laughs> about, <laughs> yeah. about a week. About a week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's, you know, if everyone's honest with themselves, they'll probably find a similar period. And, and then all of a sudden, these painful past beliefs and emotions start arising. The key is to let yourself go through it. Use your will to make a choice to let go of it all. To, to experience it and let go of it all rather than dragging it into this relationship. Mm. And when you do that, yes, you will have pain. You will have a lot of things confronted in that process. Myself and Mary have had many things confronted in this process. But what I'd encourage you to do is to do it because as you do it, it's like uh, Mary often jokes that our honeymoon period is yet to begin. <laughs> right? And, and she, she feels that we have a relationship that's the opposite of everyone else's, and that is it starts out really bad and slowly gets better. That's, com that's comforting. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, what we find is the more we address and deal with our particular, using our will, address with the unloving mm. from the past in our own relationship the better it gets and the better it gets and the better it gets and we feel like we're more on a honeymoon, mm. you know, and then as time goes on it gets better and better and we don't find it getting worse, mm. we find it getting better. We also, I, I watched your soulmate um, talks and you said um, not to make decisions when you're in your wounded space, yep. if you can. So yesterday we were split up for five minutes, didn't we? And then <laughs> <laughs> we realised it was a wounded space, so yeah. let's just hang on, yeah. Yeah, like, so at times what we've done is we've put, our relationship on hold for six months mm. and not made any decision about whether we'd continue it or not until we've addressed some particular emotions. Yeah, yeah. But we're kind of in the air like that now, I think. Yeah. Just yeah. Now we have to do that very frequently, very infrequently, I should say. Mm. At the beginning, it was like, you know, every, every fourth week, we have another, <laughs> another break for another month, you know. Because we, because we need to give each other and learn to give each other the space to make our own choices and decisions. This is a part of honouring the will. Honouring the will is so important in any relationship. And I'm not saying that we need to go along with the will. 
We just need to honour it. So there's a difference between going along with somebody's unloving exercise of their will than there is saying, no, you, you have the right to make a bad choice, mm. but I'm not going along with it. That's the use of your will. I'm just feeling my fear that's come up about if we physically separate, then that, that'll be it and I'll be a... You know, anyway, there's other layers to that one, as you probably are Exactly. Aware. We've <laughs> had to go through all of those, <laughs> yeah. myself and Mary. Yeah. <laughs> the reality is if you love each other and you are willing to work through issues of love, if you are soulmates, if you do physically separate, you'll be back together sooner or later because that's the way the soul's been constructed, mm. that you will draw each other back together. <laughs> okay. So you don't need to even worry about those particular things. You need to focus primarily on using your will in a loving manner Release the painful baggage of the past is a part of using your will in a loving manner. Okay, thank you. Yep. If we come down the front, thanks. And then across the front. Thank you. Um, I'm not actually sure how to introduce myself because I've changed my name. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone knows me as Jade, so it's nice to meet you. No it's worries, nice Jade. to be here. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask the question if your partner doesn't have a belief in God, and is very much not on your page. Is it possible if you do split and you're working on yourself that you'd be able to perhaps draw them into feeling the same way or feeling the right way or feeling the lo same loving way? So is there a way I can manipulate them into doing that? Or is, no. Is that, <laughs> is no. that what you're asking? <laughs> no, I'm kind of drawing from earlier on you saying about um, I understand the question. I was just making. <laughs> will is between um, two halves of the soul. So if I have a certain will, it can affect the other person. So I guess I'm asking: Is there a time when you have to say this isn't working together anymore, and I just have to work on myself? Certainly, there are times where you have to do that. However, if it's just to do with beliefs, so in other words, you believe in God, and they don't. I would suggest that uh, if that is the main sticking point in terms of the relationship, then there's something really going on um, from an emotional perspective about the beliefs that you're holding on to that need to be addressed. So, so let's say one person believes in God and the other person is an, athe uh, is an atheist, right? Mm -hmm. No belief in God and doesn't want to have a belief in God. Now... One or both of those people are not working through something if they are having trouble with each other just based on this belief. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, I'd suggest it's probably both. <laughs> now, many people who believe in God start to get a little sort of self-righteous about yes. it. Yes. Yeah? And uh, you find yourself doing that? Yes. Yeah? And, and once you get into that self-righteous place, you then start getting a bit frustrated, yes? A bit yes. frustrated with the person who doesn't believe in God. Yeah. yeah. Now, frustration is anger, right? Yep. Anger is, u is used to control the will of other people. Yes. Which is not the loving use of free will. Mm -hmm. So, so I, would start, I would firstly start by questioning myself and going, okay, what, what is it that I'm afraid of here that's causing me to project frustration and sometimes anger, right, about this particular issue when... Um, when aside from that particular issue, the person might be completely loving in, in, and, and honour you in a lot of other ways. Now, I'm not suggesting in your yeah. situation that's the case. What I'm suggesting is that we've got to be careful that we're not just using belief in God mm. or lack of it as an excuse to avoid a lot of other problems that are going on within our relationship. Okay. So what I notice some people doing is they... They, um, they have a belief in God themselves and then they go almost condescendingly. They go, well, I don't want you in my life anymore. You don't believe in God. Now, I would suggest that if you don't want them in your life anymore just because of that one thing, that uh, there's a lot more going on than just a belief in God. Yeah. Right? So what I would do is I would start looking firstly at that, that self-righteous sort of attitude that mm. develops. But secondly, start going, okay, what am I avoiding that's not about belief in God? Something that both yes. of us uh, is a problem between both of us. What, are, what am I avoiding? 
And you, when you start writing a list of it, you might find that list is quite long, right? Mm. And then you go, okay, the next step is to approach your partner and go, do you want to work through what I feel are these issues with our relationship? I want a yes or no answer. <laughs> and I don't only want a yes or no answer, but I want to see a willingness to actually, not a willingness, a desire to actually do, deal with these problems that I believe are problems in our relationship. Now, the majority of people don't do that in their relationship. And the reason why is because they're afraid. They know that if they do that, they'll probably lose the relationship. Mm. And so they don't confront these particular issues. I suggest, though, that if the two of you are soulmates, confronting the issues will draw you together rather than pull you apart. Okay. All right? And even if it pulls you apart temporarily, it will mm. still draw you together later on. Right? Most of us don't want to go there because there is a long list of other problems that we are unwilling to address. And then what we do is we use this as an excuse to create a barrier mm. or a problem. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah. And what we need to do is stop doing that. It's almost like using God <laughs> as an excuse to not address a lot of other issues in our life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so m the better use of your will is to go, okay, this is an issue, but let's look at all of the issues in the relationship that we could resolve without discussing the issue about God. Mm. Is there a willingness on both parties to resolve those issues? And don't always think that just because you think it's an issue, that it is actually an issue from God's perspective. Okay. Because it might not be. Right? Okay. So this is where our relationship with God becomes very important. We, we can talk about this a bit more. And in fact, in this discussion, the loving use of free will, the reason why I've called it session one is because there's going to be many sessions about the subject. Mm -hmm. and, and we won't be able to cover all of the information today. But if we can at least see that when we are using one thing as an excuse to avoid a whole heap of other things, we are u making a decision to use our will in an unloving way. Okay. The honest thing to do and the most loving thing to do would be to use our will to address that list of things that we see as a problem, also understanding that they may not actually be a problem except inside of ourselves. Okay. Right? So, for example, I'll give you some examples. A man who comes home from work and doesn't find his meal on the table, mm -hmm. right? and then who gets angry with his partner for not having the meal on the table, is he thinks that he's right because he's worked all day and she might not have worked all day and, and everything. He thinks he's right, but the reality is, from God's perspective, he is completely responsible to make his own meal. Mm -hmm. And any meal that she makes for him is a gift. Yeah. By the way... She is completely responsible for her own financial security. Mm -hmm. And if she expects him to give her half of his money to create her financial security, then she is out of harmony with free will. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, in most relationships, both parties are un, out of harmony with free will in many aspects and issues. And we, the reason why we get along is because we compromise on these different issues yeah. right? without working out what is right from God's perspective what is right mm. yep. so my suggestion is to work out what is right we are all self-responsible beings and we need to work out what is right and that even means discussing with responsibility all of the problems we feel okay. rather than running away from them and also by listening to God's loves or a list of God's loves and God's truths would that be a way as well? Of, of course, always. That's yeah. the way. So if you're living by yourself, you can still work through this issue by asking yourself the question every single time. What w if I was at one with God, what would I do? And if you don't know what you would do, then put it on the side column saying, I don't know. <laughs> right? okay. But most of the time we do know what we would do. So, for example, if you're at one with God, would you ever be angry with your partner? No. No. So, so you know that you wouldn't be angry. So if you're angry right now with your partner, you know who's out of harmony with love? Me. Yeah. Does that make sense? You know. You might not know how. Yeah. So, so you say, okay, I'm angry, so I'm definitely out of harmony with God's love. Now I've got to try and work out with my will 
How? And how to stop it. Well, how to not stop the anger. How, how, what causes my anger? You see, like the anger is like a, a thing that's telling you what's going mm. on. So, so, for example, what most people try to do is they try to do this. And this is a, not a loving use of your will, by the way. What they do is they see that they're angry. And so what they do then is they go, I'm angry. That's out of harmony with lo love. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to not be angry. Mm -hmm. Now, how successful have you generally found that? Yeah, it doesn't work very well. It's like trying to not do anything when you really want to do it yeah. is very, very hard. Mm -hmm. What we need to do instead is to find out why we are angry. And angry is always about an addiction not being met. Okay. So, so the reason why we're angry is because we have an addiction that's not being met. So then the next question is, what addiction is it? Okay. What, what's the addiction? Now, addictions are all created so that we cover over our... Fear. Fear, which is our main thing that we don't okay. want to feel. No. So, so, I'm angry. I'd be going, okay, I'm angry. I know that's out of harmony with love, but it's pointless me trying to not be angry because that doesn't work. You're not getting rid of the fear that creates okay. it. Right? So it doesn't work. So it's pointless trying to not be angry when you're angry. You must you just go into a room and just, you know, and get angry. Don't dump it on people. Dump it, you know, by yourself somewhere. And, but do it for the purpose of finding out what it is that's driving your anger. What, what particular thing is happening inside of yourself that causes you to feel like anger is justified. Okay. Right? And that might be, well, today he didn't make me feel loved. Okay. Or, you know, he, mm -hmm. came, he, he went to work this morning and didn't kiss me. Mm -hmm. it might be just as simple as that. Some, some very basic thing where we didn't feel loved. And, and the fear is, I don't feel loved. Uh, so I, the fear is, I'm unlovable. That's the fear okay. I need to get to, right? But I've got the addiction. You've got to kiss me every morning before you go to work. If you don't kiss me, I don't feel loved. <laughs> this is not good for me, right? And that's the addiction. And then when he doesn't do it, you go, oh, yeah, you didn't kiss me this morning. That shows me you don't love me. And off we go down that track. And yet all of it is driven by fear. Okay. Now the fear is unloving. Always. It's a false expectation appearing. We always, it's, it's untruthful. It's unloving. And if we used our will levelingly, we'd feel the fear rather than expressing it through our addictions and our okay. rage. Mm -hmm. right? So trying, just give up the trying. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's no good. Give that away. Ask yourself the question, what addiction, what, why am I angry? What addiction am I having mm -hmm. that causes me to be angry every time in this situation? And allow yourself to feel the fear that having the addiction not being met causes. Right. So when you don't meet your addiction, you'll feel the fear if you allow yourself to feel it. Now, if you do that in the relationship with all of these different issues, and in the end you still feel that the relationship isn't resolving, then it's got to be because he's not doing that. <laughs> mm, but yeah. I suggest for the majority of people, they haven't done that first. What they do is they go, oh, that all sounds well and good. He should do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Right. I understand or, that, yeah. Yeah, and, and we don't do it ourselves, right? We, we, we focus on the other person doing it and we basically, a lot of times, we wait for the other person to do it all and then we go, okay, maybe I might start now. Right? Because we want to feel safe and that's a fear. Or I want a friend to do it exactly the same time as me. We have to feel this right now, quick. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I'm feeling and, it. and in fact, many of the people that I've met have talk about the issue of God versus atheism in their relationship and um, usually have a timing issue in the sense that they yep. want their partner to go through the same emotional experiences that they are going through and they want the partner to agree with them all at the mm. same time. Yeah. Now that's pretty hard to manage actually, uh, very hard to create. But also it's an indication that they want to share the process. And even the need to share the process is an addiction. <laughs> Right? That will cause anger if it's not met. So uh, I see a lot of people wanting to share the process of their own enlightenment, mm. if you like. Share the process of their own growth. 
And the problem with sharing the process is you're not really fully experiencing it yourself when you do that. Okay. All right. So, so you want to give that up too because that's an unloving use. <laughs> it causes pain, right? So it's got to be an unloving use of your will. Every time mm -hmm. you want your partner to share your process, he feels like he's being pushed into doing something. So what yeah. does he do? He goes, you're not pushing me around anymore. Mm. Rah, rah, rah. There's the pain. There's the indication yeah. that something's wrong. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You answered so many other questions as well. So thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, hopefully, we might just have a, after a, a well, yeah, okay, it's 3.30. Right? And what we might do is have a bit of a break now, actually, uh, because I think, you, you probably feel like you need one. Um, and uh, and um, I think there are some cups of teas. What's the situation? Well, there's, an urn there. there's an urn there to make teas. There's some juice and drinks and some things out there. Yeah. So if you haven't brought any with you, that, then there's some in there, some snacks. And perhaps if we just... Would you like a half an hour? Just uh, yeah, to, to do whatever you need to do and... Release whatever they need to release and release that as well. Um, and if we start again at four, and what I might do is just, um, if you like, we can either continue with the discussion on free will or I can answer some general questions that each of you have about specific issues. So it's really up to you as an audience what you would like to do, as I'd be happy to do either, because I can continue this discussion of free will with another group at some point, and you'll see it at sooner or later anyway. Um, so what would you like to do as a group? Would, how many would like to continue with the discussion? How many would like to have some personal questions and stuff answered? There's more in that bracket, I think. So let's go ahead down that track after the break. Okay? All right. <laughs>